hoping to speak on today is the four R's of nutrient stewardship. And I guess one of the first things I'll point out is that it's not just about manure management, it's uh, all of you know, the nutrients applied in agriculture that fall under the umbrella of uh, four R nutrient stewardship. I also want to thank the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center for, for hosting this webcast today. The organization I work for is called the IPNI, or International Plant Nutrition Institute. And we are an organization supported by the producers of plant nutrients. Um, our mission is promoting scientific information on responsible management of plant nutrition. And uh, these are some of our member companies. What I'd hope to cover in the next 20 minutes are three main topics. First, I'll give a very general and brief uh, introduction and a few comments on sustainability in general. And I'll explain uh, uh, in a nutshell more or less what our nutrient stewardship concept is all about. And then I'll talk about uh, applying some of the principles of the four R nutrient stewardship to uh, reducing runoff losses of dissolved phosphorus in Ohio, the particular issue that's risen to prominence in, in recent years. First about sustainability, and I guess the concept of sustainable development was introduced to worldwide prominence in 1987 when the World, United Nations World Commission on environment and development released a report that was called Our Common Future. This report became the basis for definitions of sustainability and sustainable agriculture. It addressed the growing concern about the accelerating deterioration of the human environment and natural resources and the consequences of that deterioration for economic and social development. A challenge to increase food production in an economically viable way while retaining the ecological integrity of food systems is the underlying aim of sustainable agriculture. I'm seeing that the sound is cutting in and out. Does it help if I speak just a little louder? <clears throat> 25 years later, sustainability performance has become a hot topic for corporations. In their efforts to improve their performance, major food retailers are developing programs to assess and improve the performance of the agricultural systems in their supply chain. For example, the Sustainability Consortium represents a cross-section of consumer interests and it's developing ways to assess sustainability of the supply chain for all the products that uh, sold by its member companies. There is an increasing need to communicate and provide information on how we manage crop nutrition to the public and to a myriad of groups that are interested in food production. For our nutrient stewardship provides a means to connect what we do in managing nutrients to the interests of the rest of the world. And as an example, the Keystone Alliance has developed a field print calculator which includes elements of the four R's in its greenhouse gas component and future editions of this calculator may likely include a water quality index that is going to be linking to the four R's as well. Just this year, IPNI released a four R plant nutrition manual. It describes the concept of four R nutrient stewardship in nine chapters. It starts with sustainability, explains how the four R concept relates to it, and then provides scientific principles supporting each of the four R's, right source, right rate, right time, right place. It then goes on to describe how to adapt improved practices to the farm and to apply the principles to nutrient management planning and accountability. Much of what I'm talking about today derives from this manual. The book's available for purchase in both hardcover and electronic formats at the website indicated, www.ipni.net slash 4R. Definitions of sustainable agriculture abound, but most of them emphasize a need to accommodate growing demands for production without compromising natural resources. The common denominator that characterizes a sustainable system is multidimensional. It does not apply to only one dimension in isolation, but rather it applies to social, economic, and environmental dimensions all at once and together.
Next, we'll explore in detail the 4R nutrient stewardship concept, and this covers the second chapter of the IPNI Plant Nutrition Manual. Any application of nutrients has a source, rate, time, and place, and the four of them fully describe any application of nutrients. And this holds for any crop, any farm, or any enterprise engaged in growing crops or plants or trees. And it doesn't matter whether they're small-scale operations doing things by hand in India or a large mechanized operation in Ohio uh, dealing with either crops or livestock. For our nutrient stewardship is a globally recognized concept. The fertilizer rights, source, root, time, and place are connected to the goals of sustainable agriculture through the cropping system, shown as the middle circle on this slide. Fertilizer management to be considered right must support sustain stakeholders' goals for how that cropping system performs. Source, rate, time, and place need to be right for the cropping system in order for it to produce the sustainability outcomes that are valued by stakeholders. Stakeholders have a say on performance indicators and sustainability goals. And that statement is sometimes controversial. Sometimes it's perceived as, you mean to say, the EPA is going to tell me how to run my farm? But in actual fact, it's quite the opposite. The system was designed to let producers choose practices. But any sustainability-based approach needs to consider the rights and desires of stakeholders. And for agriculture, everyone's a stakeholder. People depend on the food, fuel, and fiber we produce, and they breathe the air and drink the water that we affect. So how does a producer go about getting stakeholder input? That can be done in many ways, but the important first step is recognizing that stakeholder concerns need to be addressed. How it's done is not as important as taking that proactive first step and setting out sustainability goals for future improvement for any operation the producer is working with in. A producer, a farmer, a manager of the land should be the final decision maker in selecting the practices suited to the local uh, site-specific soil, weather, and crop production condition that have the highest probability of meeting sustainability goals. Because these local conditions can influence the decision on a practice selected right up to and including the day fertilizers or manure are applied, local decision making generally performs better than regulations that dictate practices over a wide range of conditions. A balance of effort among the four rights is appropriate. It helps avoid too much emphasis on one at the expense of overlooking the others. Rate may sometimes be overemphasized because it's simple to manage and is directly related to, related to cost. When you make changes to source, time, or place of application, uh, it's easier to avoid and more frequently overlooked. They actually may hold more opportunity for improving performance but of course, they may also require major changes and in investments as compared with the small adjustments that are associated with rate decisions. The four rights are interconnected. They must work in synchrony with each other and with the surrounding environment of plants, soil, and climate and management. For most systems, soil fertility is a basic need for plants to grow productively. Although fertility is vital to productivity, not all fertile soils are productive soils. Poor drainage, drought, insects, diseases, and other factors can limit productivity, even when fertility levels of all plant nutrients are adequate. To fully understand soil fertility, we must know other factors which support or limit productivity. So in this diagram, we're showing how we can assess sustainability performance of a cropping system through the use of performance indicators. And many aspects of performance are influenced as much by crop and soil management as they are by the management of the nutrient supply. So if you choose a performance indicator like nutrient use efficiency, it's not influenced only by source rate, time, and place. It's also influenced by things like 
date of planting and the choice of uh, cultivar for the crop that you're growing. These efficiencies have trade-offs with each other. If you maximize energy use efficiency, you might be doing something uh, negative against nutrient or water use efficiency if the productivity becomes uh, limited. If you're maximizing nutrient use efficiency, uh, it may be at the expense of other indicators as well. The choice among those indicators, uh, we, we need to give stakeholders input there as to what are the key priorities for change in a system um, when, we're, when, we're, when we're making changes. So <clears throat> what we need is uh, in order to assess the, the correct or the, the, what, what is the right source, right rate, right time and place, is good science backing the practices on the, on the scientific level in terms of the, the chemistry, physics, and transport. But we also need good science that assesses the practices in the field, the classical science of agronomy. I have a diagram here that sort of in, illustrates the process, uh, more or less, of uh, adaptive management. And at the farm or local production system level, producers and their advisors make decisions based on local site factors. And they implement them. And then they evaluate the outcome of their decisions to determine what decision to make the next time in the cycle. Ideally, the assessment of, uh, the assessment of uh, practice performance would be done on the basis of the, all the indicators that are considered important to stakeholders. And, and that's the process of adaptive management. For sound guidance in this process, it's important that crop advisors have some level of professional, professional certification and training. It's also enhanced by input from research and extension at the regional level, which I'll describe next. The regional level includes agri-services, crop input dealers and agricultural service providers, since they make decisions affecting the capacity to deliver the right sources uh, at the right volumes in the right time and place to meet the demands of the producers. There are logistical challenges in distribution of fertilizer nutrients, which the agri-services industry needs to meet. And the regional level also includes agronomic scientists who work to develop and deliver decision support to managers. Their output's a recommendation of the right source, rate, time, and place, again, in relation to local site factors. Decision support systems need continual evaluation and improvement to accommodate changes in availability of technology and changes in the plant soil climate system. The output of decision support systems requires validation in the real world plant production system. Validation can include many of the same performance indicators as those used at the farm level. Agricultural service providers in the private sector can also participate in such validation through the establishment of regional crop response databases. And the professional participation of their crop advisors with um, agro agronomic scientists can contribute towards improving the decision support provided by commercial crop advisors. There's also a higher level called the policy level involving the regulatory and institutional framework within which uh, producers, managers, advisors, and the industry operates. It, in, it includes decision making on infrastructure enabling the transport and delivery of crop nutrients and crop commodities and on support for education and research. This level becomes important for the issues uh, like the distribution of nutrients um, in regions where there is simply um, more nutrients in manure than, than the crops can be removing, removed, than the crops are removing from fields. This 4R nutrient stewardship concept relates management practices to sustainability goals at all levels, including the farm level. Asking farmers to define their sustainability goals encourages a higher level of commitment and participation and diminishes the negative reactions that tend to result from the imposition of sustainability and counting systems from other parties. So the adoption of a 4R nutrient stewardship plan would include identification of a farm's sustainability goals. I want to shift attention now to a little bit of information on how we apply this concept to 
uh, the situation in Ohio. The issue of losses of dissolved phosphorus in runoff water has been a major concern in the past few years because the amount and concentration of dissolved pea in rivers flowing to Lake Erie have been increasing, and so has the frequency of algal blooms. Even though this wasn't the case in this past year because the lack of rain really slowed the flow of phosphorus, but it's still important to pay attention to crop management since there's at least four million acres of cropland that drain into the western basin of Lake Erie. I want to begin with some background information on the cropland soils of, of the state of Ohio. Not all this land is necessarily in the uh, Lake Erie watershed, but I think this is fairly representative of that land as well. IPNI periodically summarizes soil test, test information from labs across North America. This slide shows the distribution of soil test phosphorus levels across Ohio. The blue bars <coughs> present <coughs> soil test distribution in 2001. The red bars in 2005, and the green bars in 2010, the last summary we've conducted. In 2010, roughly 48% of the soils tested in the maintenance range between the critical level and the maintenance limit, uh, the critical level for corn and soybeans, and the maintenance lab limit for wheat and alfalfa. We had about 26% of the soils testing um, above that 40 part per million level, and 26% uh, below. Ideally, if everyone was following recommendations, soils should be moving to within that maintenance range, because above that range, recommendations call for less phosphorus than the crop is removing. Below that range, recommendations usually call for more. But compared to a lot of other regions with phosphorus issues, the soils of Ohio are not that high in phosphorus in general. We can also look at the um, uh, cropland phosphorus balance, which is another important indicator of uh, the nutrition practices that are going on there. This figure compares the inputs of phosphorus in the form of manure and fertilizer to the outputs in the form of crop removal of phosphorus. The uh, input in the, the brown shaded area shows the input of phosphorus in manure applied to land. This gray shaded area shows the input of phosphorus in uh, fertilizer. And then the green bars represent the output of the removal of phosphorus in uh, harvested crops uh, from the land. And you can see that over time, um, in the past, in past, in decades far past, there was a great surplus of phosphorus being applied to build up the fertility of the land. And in uh, more recent days, we've come much closer to, to a balance. Of course, this indicator is only showing the average. It's still quite possible that within the states, you could have regions where a surplus is being applied and other regions where there is a deficit. And uh, that uh, is proved to some extent by the, the previous slide, which showed the soil test distribution. IPNI has one other uh, nutrient uh, performance tool we call NUGAS. And that shows the, it's one where you can map out the uh, nutrient surplus uh, for nitrogen, for phosphorus, for potassium. What we show in 1987, uh, this area here um, uh, bounded by the red line is all part of the Lake Erie watershed. And you can see that most of that region was in a small surplus, 6 to 25 pounds of P205 per acre, uh, back in 1987. When we move to 2007, you can see that most of the region is yellow here, which is basically considered to be within uh, plus or minus five pounds from, from a balance um, of uh, uh, application versus removal. When we apply the 4R principles to phosphorus loss, first we need to think about the predominant soils of the region. We know a lot of the watershed has rather flat, heavy clay soils. We know they generate runoff. <clears throat> Whether it reaches the stream entirely over land or through tile drains, it first interacts with the soil surface. These soils have very few available work days as well. The saying is two days between too wet and too dry. And the timeliness of planting becomes critical. And thus, these soils often get fall broadcast fertilizer when the opportunity arises. But 
since fertilizer on the soil surface can greatly enrich the runoff water with dissolved phosphorus, we need to think of source rate time place alternatives that um, meet uh, the unique set of constraints uh, of this uh, cropping system. What I've illustrated here, I don't have time to go, go into detail, and uh, the next speaker, Greg Labarge, is far more qualified to do so than I am. But I just wanted to show how you can uh, list specific source rate time place uh, combinations and compare their advantages and their limitations. And in so doing, uh, offer a suite of different practices um, with, with different performance uh, to growers. And if uh, we're, we're making, uh, we're recognizing that phosphorus is an issue here, um, we would want to have uh, programs that educate and encourage and support the movement to, towards um, uh, combinations of source rate, time, and place where the phosphorus does get placed into the soil um, and where uh, avoidance of uh, contamination and surface runoff um, it would be occurring. So just to wrap up my main points, the 4R Plant Nutrition Manual supports sustainable nutrient stewardship. The concept engages stakeholders to shape sustainability goals, allowing producers choice for local selection of practices. And focusing on right place is important to the reduction of phosphorus losses from cropping systems with compatible choices for source, rate, and timing. Here again is the URL for further information on the four R's.